We gather today as people of earth and spirit here at St Michael's. St Michael's has always been an open and welcoming congregation. No matter what your status in life may be, no matter what your faith is or sexuality, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, whether you are joining us online today or present here in the church on Sunday, you are welcome. My name is Peter Burnham and I am the visiting minister for today. We acknowledge the first peoples of this land. The eternal spirit has long dwelled in the great land of the Southern Cross and with the first peoples of this ancient land. We acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Wurundjeri and Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and future. Our gathering words. For most of us, we associate wine with joy, celebration and a shared companionship. For some of us, it provides a moment of relaxation after a hard day's work or an addition to a family dinner. For others, wine becomes an addiction which blights their life and destroys their relationships. We remember the story in John's Gospel, chapter 2, of Jesus changing the water into wine. Bishop Spong, in his commentary on John's Gospel, warns us that treating the signs that Jesus used as literal truth distorts the point of the story. Literalism, he suggests, is always the enemy of faith, and John's Gospel perhaps more than any other part of the biblical text, makes a mockery of literalism, constantly holding it up to ridicule. The reading from John 15 today also confronts us with a number of long monologues by Jesus. One of the ancient analogies by which the prophets referred to the people of Israel was that they were God's vineyard, the writer of this gospel now takes that image out of his Jewish past and employs it to emphasise his message of mystical oneness or intimacy and connectedness. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. God is the vine dresser. So think of yourselves as the canes, that is the branches of the vine, and see how we are all bound together in this divine process and purpose. Our task is to remain attached to the vine. Our prayer of awareness. As we gather in the silence of this sacred place, let us become aware we are in a sustaining, life-giving presence, active in our universe since the first moment of its existence. We marvel at life. We celebrate ourselves as a life form, giving the source of all that is a unique expression in our awareness, in our intelligence and in our ability to communicate with each other. Today, as we consider the importance of being attached to the source of our life, Jesus, human like us, in his life he discerned where this presence is found, in the everyday, in human interaction, in feeding, in caring for others, in visiting the sick, in sharing and in being a good neighbour. We remember his example of living fully and loving totally. May we allow this life and teaching today to motivate all that we do. Amen. And let us say together the Jesus Prayer. Father and Mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name 
echoes through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of this world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. And with the bread that we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. And from the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. So it is common in most Christian churches for us to share the sign of peace, which is a sign of acceptance and love and companionship towards those with whom we worship or with those whom we are in relationship with. So today I invite you to share the sign of peace with those with whom you are with and with those in this community of faith. May the Divine Presence be with you all. Amen. John 15, 1-8 The importance of being connected to the vine. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire 
and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. For the community of John, who passed on the signs of Jesus, we give thanks. The contemporary reading titled Branch Meeting. My little branch, I am sending you this special treat, a piece of me for you to eat. I am so sad to hear you are unwell and bend and wilt and even hope to die where you struggle in the baking sand, so hot and endless dry. I know you thirst, for I was thirsty too when I was there, the branch for you. How easy it would be, I used to think, to reach and fill my cup at pools where others drink and seem to thrive. They sprang so tall I had to blink to see they weren't alive. My little branch, this fruit is bruised and from stinging sand and hammering heat and whipping wind for you. Take it then and eat it. And when you eat, remember you too are part of me, the branch and the tree. With me you are cut down, but with me too you grow and with those other twigs, all set to sweep away the cactus and the thorn and green the desert sand. For I am your shelter and your shade from fire and sun. I am your place to hide from fire and sun. I am your place to hide in wild and empty storm. I will stretch my green arms over you and will always be your sky. For the words ancient and modern, for the words that encourage us to connect to the source of life, we give thanks. Title of uh, the address today is A Mutual Indwelling. And words that help us to think about that are words like abiding, connectedness, attachment. In December 1959, I'd finished year 12 at Ballarat High School, and not having any idea of what I wanted to do job-wise, a mate and I decided to go grape picking in Redcliffe near Mildura. So we caught the Vinelander, the name of the train which went from Melbourne to Mildura overnight and passed through Ballarat at about 10pm. The next morning, we joined dozens of other young people who were looking for grape picking jobs as the train was met by grape growers looking for labour. For the next six weeks, my mate and I worked in the searing heat of a Mildura summer. 38 to 40 degrees nearly every day. We had to dodge snakes and big lizards as we picked as many baskets of grapes that we could each day. The day began at 6am and finished at 6pm, an hour off for the evening meal, and then we would shake down racks of dried grapes that were now sultanas until 11pm at night. It was hard, hot work, seven days a week. But it taught me a lot about grapes and the vines which bear fruit and those vines which don't. But before we engage with the text of John 15, 
A few words about the background of John's Gospel and the portrait that it gives us of Jesus. Bishop John Spong, in one of his books, shares the opinion that he finds the Gospel of John both thrilling and exasperating. The Gospel according to Robert Funk's The Five Gospels begins with creation. No birth or childhood stories of Jesus. Baptism of Jesus is presupposed but not mentioned. Jesus speaks in long, involved discourses. Jesus is a philosopher and a Jewish mystic. He performs no exorcisms and he is the theme of his own teaching in the Gospel. He reflects extensively on his own mission and purpose and person. He has little to say about the poor and the oppressed and his public ministry lasts three years. The cleansing of the temple occurs very early in his ministry and foot washing replaces the Last Supper. That is a very, very different picture of Jesus that we see in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke. Dr Bart Ehrman, who chairs the Department of Religious Studies in the University of North Carolina, in his book, Misquoting Jesus, refers to the Johannai community as a group of Jews who came to believe that Jesus was the Messiah and who continued to maintain their Jewish identity and to worship in their Jewish synagogue. We do not know where this community was located, except it may have been somewhere in Palestine where Aramaic was spoken. The signs which Jesus did in this gospel, and there are many, many more if you read the ending of this gospel, were designed to convince the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. And in the early years of the Jesus movement, Jewish Christians were part of the synagogue. But then, as time went on, a disruption occurred. It seems that those Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah were excluded from the synagogue. The first century Jews, by and large, rejected any idea that Jesus could be the Messiah. And for most of them, the Messiah was to be a figure of grandeur and power who would overthrow the power and oppression of Rome. And Jesus was clearly nothing of the sort. He was an itinerant preacher who was executed for treason against the state. Scholars tell us that John's Gospel was written somewhere towards the end of the first century, probably in Ephesus. We are therefore talking about a period of time from 60 to 80 years after the death of Jesus. Many scholars, of course, have wrestled with what were the original words of Jesus passed down through oral and written tradition and what were additions to the text provided by later understandings of Jesus in the early Christian movement. There is no doubt that the character of Jesus is remarkably different in each gospel and from the oral and written traditions they shaped their portraits of Jesus in line with their particular theological understanding. In the narrative of John 15, Jesus knew he was about to leave his disciples and he takes time to prepare them with a series of farewell discourses which we find in chapters 16 and 17. He wanted to inform them of how to remain attached to him, to encourage them not to fall away and to remain in his love. In chapter 15, he uses the analogy or metaphor of the vine and its branches to summarise these important lessons. Again, if we were to literalise this metaphor, we would destroy its spiritual meaning. 
The anonymous gospel storyteller that we call John creates for us a metaphor drawn from the agricultural life of his people. We are the Cains, closely attached to one another, and we are attached to each other, and the life that flows through the divine flows through us. Biblical scholars do not believe that this storyteller was an eyewitness to the life and teaching of Jesus, but rather that he experienced the life and teachings of Jesus through the stories that were handed down through the community in which he lived. Jesus' relation to his disciples is now given particular metaphorical shape in the figure of the authentic vine, and they will bear fruit to the extent they remain attached to him. And of course, the question is, what is the fruit? Well, the fruit is love. Vines do not have branches, they have canes. And each year, the canes are proved and pruned rather from the vine and piled in the vineyard to be burned. The vines will not bear good fruit if they are not pruned annually. Therefore, to use Robert Funk's translation of this passage in the book, The Five Gospels, he says this as he translates this passage. You must stay attached to me and I must stay attached to you. Notice that the attachment is mutual. Perhaps we could say in colloquial language, hey, make your home in me. The language of abiding or attachment is the language of intimacy, expressing a continuing relationship of closeness or attachment. The image then of the vine is a rich source of spiritual reflection for us. It invites us to sense the divine as beneath us, coming from the soil, rather than a power coming down from above. It is interesting to note that the concept of attachment or, or indwelling occurs not only in the Christian religion, but also in the Hindu religion. In the Bhagavad Gita, which is the best known and most influential of all Hindu scriptures, in chapter 9, verse 28, we find this. In this passage, Krishna is speaking, and Hindus who believe that Krishna is the incarnation of God and is the spark of divinity that lies at the very core of human personality, this is what is recorded for us. Those who worship me with devotion dwell in me, and I too in them. The same injunction, of course, was reiterated by both Jesus and Muhammad. Therefore, our task is to remain attached to the life-giving energy of Jesus as his followers. I like this concept of attachment. It implies connection, bond, coupling, link, tie, staying. And the antonym or opposite of attachment is estrangement, alienation and divorce. Attachment was merely the result of the feeding relationship between the child and the caregiver. Because the caregiver feeds the child and provides nourishment, the child becomes attached. However, Bowlby observed that even as the child was being fed by another caregiver, it did not diminish the anxiety experienced by children when they were separated from their primary caregivers. So attachment is an emotional bond with another person. 
Bowlby believed that the earliest bonds formed by children with their caregivers has a tremendous impact that continues throughout life. So what determines successful attachment? Behaviourist psychologists believed that it was food that led to attachment behaviour. But Bowlby and others demonstrated that nurture and responsiveness were also important determinants of attachment. While attachment styles displayed in adulthood are not necessarily the same as those seen in infancy, early attachments can have a major impact on later relationships. It was indeed the developmental psychologist Eric Erickson who put forward the view that a child in the first nine months of its life learns to either trust or mistrust its world. Those children who are securely attached in childhood tend to have good self-esteem, strong romantic relationships and the ability to be self-disclosing to others. Those children who are securely attached as infants tend to have better self-reliance as they grow older. And these children can also be more independent, perform better at school, have successful social relationships and experience less depression and anxiety. So as we contemplate our lives in the context of attachment, what are the important attachments that we have made in our lives? Have our attachments been nurturing or destructive? Have we felt secure in the attachments that we have made? Or does separation anxiety overcome us when we're not close to those whom we love? And what is our attachment to the divine? The idea or concept of indwelling or attachment is also found in the writings of St Paul. In the book of Ephesians, he writes that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And in writing to the Galatians, Paul spoke of the sufferings of childbirth until the Christ is formed within you. That spiritual intimacy which flows from our attachment to the divine must always be a relationship of love. For love is the fruit of the vine alive in us. Amen.
And so the prayers of the people Creator God, source of our life, may we approach this day with joy and may this time together be for the upbuilding of your love in and through our lives. In this season that we call autumn, we pause to remember how we are graced and encouraged by the beauty that is around us. As we affirm the earth, and our care with and for it, so too do we commit our care to people around us. May we as individuals and as a community be a kind and encouraging voice and a gentle presence to all we meet this week. We lament that there are many in our world and in this city who lack the basic necessities of daily life. And may we all learn the ways of compassion and justice and where there is violence and oppression, may it all cease. In our hope for a better world, we would like to embrace that good spirit in people that strives to overcome the emotions and behaviour of fear and hatred and prejudice. And in our hope for a better world, we would like to embrace that force within ourselves and the force that is beyond ourselves that makes forgiveness possible. May we breathe the life of the divine presence today, release us from the restrictions of our humanity that we may abide in the divine within us. Amen. And so the work of St Michael's continues, of course, during the pandemic. And so may the gifts that we bring today as symbols of our deep desire for divine love to transform our life, effort and substance into works of creative compassion for each other, for our wider community and for the world beyond. Amen. And so our final hymn, past and present with our dreaming.
and our blessing. Today, go from this place with hope to point to the signs of love. Go in peace, knowing that the divine presence is with you. And may the starlight of the heavens bring promises each night and signs of new life as we walk and abide in the source of all life. Amen. Thank you.